Glad you can join me on Understanding the Times Radio today. And this week, we're going to focus heavily on good news, the ultimate good news, the hope of heaven. And it is the believer's ultimate destiny. It will be an eternity with loved ones. There'll be no tears, no fears, no cares, no pain, no affliction. Dr. Ron Rhodes is my guest, and I'm basing the interview heavily off of a book of his that we carry. I'll say more about that later. That was a little clip of Randy Alcorn, and I'm going to be playing a number of sound bites today, and I think the sound bites will complement my discussion with Ron Rhodes, who you've heard on this program many times. Ron, welcome back to Understanding the Times. Thank you, Jen. It's always good to be with you. And Ron Head's Reasoning from the Scriptures Ministry and I'll give you contact just a little bit later. You know, Ron, where to start? And I'm basing my discussion today kind of off your book, What Happens After Life, 21 Amazing Revelations About Heaven and Hell. We're going to focus heavily on heaven. But I think let's start with something you raise and needs clarification, and that is you talk about an intermediate state. And at the moment of death, we are in paradise as believers But help clarify, what is the intermediate state? The intermediate state is an in-between state. That is, it's the state of our existence in between the time our mortal bodies die and the time that we receive resurrection bodies in the future. Now, for the Christian, here's what happens. The moment that you die, your spirit slips out of your body just as easily as a hand slips out of a glove. And at that moment, the spirit of the Christian goes directly to heaven where he or she dwells with the Lord until that future day of the rapture when they will receive resurrection bodies. And during this whole time, the Christian's body on earth is still in the grave, but the spirit is present with the Lord in heaven. So in reality, physical death is actually a step into blissful joy. It's not a terminus, but a transition into great glory. And this, Jan, is in fulfillment of 1 Corinthians 15.55. Christ has taken the sting out of death for the Christian. Now, Jan, the intermediate state for unbelievers is a lot more sobering. At the moment of death, their spirit departs from the body, and they go to a temporary place of confinement and punishment. In fact, 2 Peter 2, verse 9, portrays them as condemned prisoners being closely guarded in a spiritual jail while they await future sentencing and final judgment. That judgment will be at the great white throne judgment. And here's the thing, Jan. One's destiny in the intermediate state depends wholly upon whether you have placed faith in Jesus Christ during one's earthly existence. And so it's a sobering thing. You've got one lifetime, your earthly life, to decide for or against Christ. Now, for the Christian, Jan, what I like to point out is that because of what Christ has done for us, we no longer need fear death. You know that death has a long history of enslaving people. Well, one of the reasons Christ came into the world was to, and I quote from Hebrews, was to deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. Now, you can anchor yourself on 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 and 55, because this talks about our new bodies that we're going to get. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Jan, did you know that among the ancient Jews, death was viewed like a big mouth in the ground, waiting to swallow up people? So the Apostle Paul does a play on words and says, Death itself is going to be swallowed up because of what Jesus did for us. Even though people typically are afraid of death, Christ has taken the sting out of death because the moment that we die, our spirits go to heaven, And then we await that future day of the rapture when we receive a glorious new body. I appreciate that (laughs) clarification, Ron, because I think some people think that when we pass on, the body actually goes immediately to heaven, and actually it's the spirit that goes to heaven, but the body will join the spirit at the time of the rapture. And at that time, what an upgrade we have coming, because the new body is going to never deteriorate. I want to play another soundbite. It's again... John Ankerberg with Randy Elkhorn talking about the forthcoming perfection, folks. That's what awaits us. Let's talk about the new bodies that God is going to give to us, all right? Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 15, the body that is sown is perishable. The one that dies, it's perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. If you've ever seen anybody die, 
It's not a pretty sight. But it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. We can already feel as we're growing older, the fact is we're getting weaker. When you get to death, you can hardly do anything. You can hardly breathe. But it's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. Paul says it's going to be raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And he uses Jesus' resurrected body as our model. Explain what this new body is going to be like. Well, we can look at Jesus' body because he's called the first fruits from the dead. We're told that we will be like him when we see him as he is. And what that means is that we can look at Jesus' resurrection body and determine from it some things about our resurrection bodies. He made a point of saying to his disciples, touch me. I got this physical body. I am not a ghost. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as I have. What do we learn from that? Well, the resurrection body has flesh and bones. Now, it will not be a body subject to sin and death and suffering and all the things that came from the curse. In Revelation 22, we're told there will be no more curse. So Jesus defeats death, he defeats the curse, he reverses the curse, and in our resurrection bodies, we will experience life as as we've never known it, because we can imagine what the resurrected life will be like on our very best day when you felt your best and you looked your best and you had lots of energy and you thought, this was the peak of my life. And we tend to look back and think, I passed my peak. Well, guess what? In the resurrection, our peak still awaits all of us and we will never pass that peak. Will we have supernatural abilities like Jesus? I mean, Jesus could just float right up into the sky. I mean, how far does this new body go? We don't know for sure on that. Was that unique to Jesus as the God-man that he did that? Uh, but we do know that certainly these bodies will be at maximum capacity and they'll be in a better form than they ever have been. So there won't be sickness. We do know uh, for instance, that there are streets in the New Jerusalem and there are gates that enter the city. Well, normally that would indicate streets you walk on and gates you enter through. So it, probably not everybody flying around all the time and roads that could be vehicles, it could be horse and carriage, it could be all kinds of things. Uh, there's certainly no reason to believe there won't be technology uh, but certainly our bodies will experience what our bodies experience now, but without the curse, without sin in the world. And I think, Ron Rhodes, the key is the verse you referenced it a moment ago, 1 John 3, 2, we will be like him. Amazing. Well, that's right. And that's so important because from the moment that you and I are born, the outer man is decaying. That's what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians four sixteen. But our resurrection bodies will be just like the body of Jesus. And I have to tell you that these bodies are necessary in order to inhabit heaven. Jan, you know that whenever God appeared to people back in Bible times, they always fell down to their knees about to die. I mean, they were just so weak. We can't be in God's presence in our present bodies for very long. But we're going to have brand new body upgrades designed specifically for living face to face with God. The perishable will clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal will be clothed with immortality. And the great thing is that all liability to disease and death will be forever gone in our imperishable, immortal bodies. The effects of the fall and of sin will be removed. And Jan, here's some good news. There will be no more gray hairs, no more cholesterol buildup, no more cancer, no more heart disease, no more wrinkles on the face. All of that is gone. We will have absolute perfection from the top of our heads down to the bottom of our feet. And as well, death will be a thing of the past. Once you're in heaven, Jan, the subject of death never comes up again because nobody dies. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line from Texas, Dr. Ron Rhodes. We carry a number of his books. I may reference some of them later, but I'm basing my comments for this hour heavily on the little book that we carry, What Happens After Life, 21 Amazing Revelations About Heaven and Hell. We'll say a word about hell later at the end of the program, perhaps, because I'm trying to focus here on the glories of heaven that await us. Ron Rhodes, the new heavens and the new earth, 
that actually is a phenomenon that happens after the millennium. But why don't you just clarify, why on earth do we need a new heaven? Could it possibly have been defiled by Satan? Yes, it's defiled by Satan as well as sin. You might remember that when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God placed a curse upon the earth. And before the eternal kingdom can be made manifest, God must deal with this cursed earth. And of course, the stain of Satan must also be removed. He's been scheming on this earth for millennia. And so scripture speaks of the passing of the old heavens, by the way, that refers to earth's atmosphere and the stellar universe, as well as the earth. After the universe is cleansed and God creates a new heaven and a new earth, all vestiges of the curse and Satan's presence will be utterly removed. Jan, I know that Christians love to debate, and they debate what this is going to be like. Some Christians hold to what's called the replacement view, and that's the idea that God will totally annihilate the present universe and then create a brand new one. And then there's the renewal view, which is my view, which holds that God is going to renew and renovate the present universe so that the curse is gone and the stain of Satan's presence is removed. And so the way I like to look at it is this. We're going to live in resurrected bodies on a resurrected earth in a resurrected universe. I'm going to play a clip complimenting what you've just said, Ron, and this would be a discussion again with John Ankerberg, Ed Heinsohn, Mark Hitchcock, and Ron Rhodes, and it's talking about we're trying to describe the indescribable is what we're trying to do this hour, folks. We really can't do it. And I think that these three gentlemen take sort of a stab at it here in this little soundbite. I find it interesting that God says he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. We got a new Jerusalem. Now, this new Jerusalem, I think John ran, ran out of ways to try to describe what he was looking at. Mm. Okay. I mean, yeah, tell us golden, a little. Well, golden streets that were transparent like glass you could see through. He tries to describe the gates of the city like gigantic pearls. That way, if they're natural, that'd be a huge oyster. Yeah. And God could do that, I suppose. But, uh, and, and the walls are made of precious stones. The other thing that's interesting to me, John, is that the, the gates of the city are named for the 12 tribes of Israel and yet the foundations of the city are named for the 12 apostles. And what you have in heaven, in eternity, the entire family of God, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, the tribulation and millennial believers, all genuine believers of all time are together in this wonderful place. And you know what else? You know, you mentioned the transparent gold and the jewels all over the city. Try to picture it. The God of glory is the light that lamps up the city. You see, God's glory is something that's magnificent. And if you can imagine that light penetrating the transparent gold and then refracting mm. through the multiple precious stones there. You know, John was using the best language that he could, he could figure out. Yeah. But even what he described is going to be better than that because no mind can even conceive of how great it's going, to be, it's going to be. And no eye has seen, no ear has heard. So as good as John did in describing it, it's even better. Yeah. His challenge of trying to describe the indescribable That's right. uh, at times in the book of Revelation. And as best we can understand it in our fallible way of thinking, it's beyond your imagination. It's so wonderful, you don't want to miss this. This heavenly city that, that John describes, it's really a 1,400-mile a cube. To me, what I see in this passage, there's, there's two things here. There's a new heaven and a new earth. This present earth and the heavens are taken apart by God and made new. So there's a new earth, there's a new universe. But then the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven from God and sits on the new earth. It's kind of like the, the metropolis or the capital city, really, of all of eternity. And that, that heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, is this big 1,400-mile cube. And some have pointed out that in the, the tabernacle in the wilderness was a 15-foot cube, the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. And in Solomon's temple, it was a 30-foot cube. And here you have this 1,400-mile cube that... Really, this, this heavenly city, the New Jerusalem, where God's throne is, where He dwells, is just one huge uh, holy of holies yeah. of where God dwells. And so man, excluded from God's presence back in the garden, will be brought back into the presence of God, really back to what some have called like an Edenic temple city. It would be like the Garden of Eden and this huge temple city, this huge holy of holies where uh, we fellowship with our Creator. 
So other things absent, there'll be no night, there'll be no need for sleep, there'll be no sea, there'll be no more curse, no pain, no death, no guilt, nor shame. There'll be no focus on self. There'll be no loneliness, no discouragement, no tiredness, no envy, no jealousy, no broken relationships. You want to add to that, Ron? I would like to just point out that this incredible city called the New Jerusalem has an incredible architect and designer. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Now, if you go outside at night and you look straight up, you're going to see countless stars. It's glorious if you live in a part of the world where you don't have air pollution, because you can just see so much in terms of the glory of God in the stellar universe. Well, Christ created all of that. Colossians 1.16, John 1.3. These verses indicate that Christ created the stellar universe. I point that out because if you're impressed with the stars, you haven't seen anything yet. The New Jerusalem is designed and built by Jesus Christ, and it's going to be incredibly glorious. And not only is the city itself glorious, but what makes it super special is the presence of God. Never again will our fellowship with God be broken. You ask, will we mourn those not in heaven? And you say, God may selectively purge our memories. I do hope you're right. Do you want to comment on that? Many people through the years have wondered how we can have no mourning and how we can have joy in heaven if, for example, we have relatives or friends that are suffering in hell. Now, of course, that's not an easy question to answer, but I do believe that Isaiah 65, 17 gives us a little bit of a hint as to what might be going on. Scripture says here, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. So it seems like God will selectively purge some of our memories. And that would obviously include bad memories of people rejecting Christ that were relatives or friends. I think this is an important thing. Even aside from that, Jan, God himself has promised us that we're going to be joyful, happy, and there will be no mourning. Now, God can do anything that he wants to do by simply speaking the word. So there may be factors we're unaware of in terms of how God will operate in order for us not to be mourning. But it does seem to make good sense to me, based upon the scriptures, that God will selectively purge some of those memories. Again, basing my conversation from the book, What Happens After Life, let me just comment quickly that we carry, I think, a total of six of Ron Rhodes' books. And I want to just say a word about at least one of them. We carry his newest book, which is 40 Days Through Bible Prophecy, a panoramic survey of the end times and beyond. That includes some fast facts. It's frequently asked questions. It's a very helpful tool in my online store. The end times book in chronological order. We carry the book and the workbook. We carry his book, 40 Days Through Daniel, 40 Days Through Revelation, and a book for beginners, Basic Bible Prophecy, Olive Tree Views, Views as in Viewpoint olivetreeviews.org, or call my office, and we'll be happy to get any of these products out to you. Many of you write that you're in churches that don't talk about this topic, particularly issues concerning the last days, and you'd like to learn a lot more about it, so that's why we carry such products and put them in our store, olivetreeviews.org, or sign up for our various newsletters, print and e and we promote some of these products in those. I want to ask you this, Ron, because you write about face-to-face fellowship with God. That is hard for us to wrap our minds around. Some folks hear the supposed still small voice of God, and I think I've heard that several times, but nobody has a direct encounter with God, not even those who claim to take a trip to heaven, and I'm getting there in just a moment or two. So this face-to-face fellowship with God, talk to us about that for a minute. Jan, to me, there can't be anything more sublime and more satisfying for the Christian than to enjoy the sheer delight of unbroken fellowship with God. We will have immediate and completely unobstructed access to God himself. We will be face-to-face with God, as Scripture puts it, and we will be able to gaze upon his glorious presence forever. So to me, that's going to be an exhilarating thrill for believers. In 1 Timothy 6.16, We read about he who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light. Well, Revelation 21 tells us that that glorious God will reside intimately among his own people. And verse 3 says, they shall be his people and God himself shall be among them. 
to me, the very essence of our happiness in heaven relates to our daily fellowship with God throughout all eternity. In fact, as one of the Psalms puts it, there are eternal pleasures in the presence of God. I believe that the crowning wonder of our experience in the New Jerusalem, the eternal city, will be the perpetual presence of God among us. This is something to look forward to. Revelation 22, 4 says, they will see his face. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, Paul says, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. This is something that ought to put wind in your spiritual sails. Yes. Going to play one more clip here, this segment, and that would be Erwin Lutzer talking to John Ankerberg, because I'm not ready to quite leave this new Jerusalem, this cube that's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Room for literally billions of people because it'll be the home for saints throughout all time. When you read Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 and you have this grand description of heaven, let's begin, for example, by talking about its size. The New Jerusalem, if you do the math, it, uh, it seems to be a cube, and that cube would be 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide, and its depth 1,500 miles, which means that that is a huge area. Now, if we're to take that literally, there would be hundreds of thousands of different stories in heaven. And uh, of course, in our contemporary way, if we divided it up into apartments or condominiums, there would be room for multiplied millions and even billions of people. You remember what Jesus said to the disciples? He assured them, he said, in my Father's house, are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I want the people who are listening right now to know that if they come to faith in Christ, as we will be explaining in a few moments, there is a crown in heaven that only they can wear, and I believe that there's a place waiting for them that they are supposed to occupy. Ron Rhodes, I think we should hit on one subject here before I have to take my midpoint break, and that is a lot of my listeners have loved ones in heaven right now. They've preceded them in death, and those loved ones wouldn't want to come back to earth. Am I right there? You are exactly right, and that's one of the reasons why you shouldn't wish for them to come back, right. because for you to wish for them to come back is to ask them to live among sinful people a dark world where there is a great deal of crime and darkness and immorality, a place where there is mourning, whereas in heaven there is no mourning, a place where death permeates on earth, but in heaven death is something of the past. As hard as it is for us to be separated from our loved ones, we should never want them to come back to earth simply because that would not be in their best interest. The better scenario is that we will eventually go to them, and that's because there's going to be a grand reunion. And this is taught basically in the Old and the New Testament. You might remember that back in Old Testament times, let's take Jacob as an example. It talks about how Jacob breathed his last and then was gathered to his people. You often read about that phrase in Scripture. Upon the moment of death, they are gathered to their people. That's referring to living people in heaven. Likewise, in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 17, Paul talks about a reunion of Christians. And that reunion is going to be all the more glorious because human beings will no longer have a sin nature. We will no longer have a nature that gives rise to arguments and disagreements. All of those things are gone once we're in heaven. Not only will we have a reunion, but the relationships in that reunion will be perfect. And Jan, it gets even better. Not only do we get to fellowship with our Christian loved ones and friends, we also get to fellowship with people that we've never met including the greats of church history. No matter who you read about in church history, all the famous people there, you're going to one day be with them in heaven. And it gets even better. All the great people you read about in the Bible, David, Mark, Matthew, and John, and all the others, you're going to fellowship with them as well. It's going to be an incredible existence. Talk to Dr. Rod Rhodes for the hour. You can learn more at ronrhodes.org, ronrhodes.org. He heads Reasoning from the Scriptures Ministry. And we have featured his products for 20 years here at Olive Tree Ministries. And you can find the products in our online store, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. When I get back, we're going to talk for at least a few minutes about 
What about this heavenly tourism? People who are visiting heaven, in some cases, many, many times a day, and having extensive conversations with God. Do we take those folks seriously, or do we maybe run the other way? We'll talk about that when I get back. I'm coming back in just a moment. Don't go away. John, I've thought about this. I don't think in heaven we're going to need name tags. I think we're going to recognize one another. I think intuitively we'll say, oh, this is Abraham, this is Peter, this is John who wrote the book of John. We'll know that and we'll be able to connect with these people and think about it. I'd like to talk with Abraham. I'd like to ask him about his willingness to sacrifice his son. And there are several other questions I'd like to ask him. But here's the good news. I can take as long as I want to spend time with Abraham and David and the others that we know about. You know why? Because we have all of eternity. So you can also spend as much time with him as you want because eternity is very, very long. Yeah, and I think one of the points of this hour is that eternity is wonderfully long in the right place. In the wrong place, that would be in the lake of fire, in hell, in Hades. It is unthinkable. And we might talk about that as we move into the close of the program. Let me just give a quick heads up that we had our bi-monthly Understanding the Times one-night event back on March 16th with special guest, Pastor Tom Hughes. Co-hosts were Pastor Mark Henry and yours truly, and you can watch that two-hour event. That included a message, a roundtable discussion of current event happenings, and a short Q&A at my website, olivetreeviews.org, and then go to video, Olive Tree Views, and then go to video. You can get a DVD of the event for just $10 in my online store, or by calling us You can watch these live stream events through the Olive Tree app, the Mark Henry Ministries app, and you can watch them as they happen at markhenryministries.com. You can watch them post-program at the various places, including my website. Very, very interesting evening because, folks, so much is going on that some of it's even unexplainable. Is the banking crisis going to lead to central bank digital currency? I think so. Is there a war in Europe that's about to spread? It could even spread as far as the Middle East. With so much going on that I think has biblical relevance, and that's what we try to cover not only on this program, but on the every other month events that we hold at Mark Henry's Church here in the suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now, I am spending the hour with one of my favorite guests, Dr. Ron Rhodes, Reasoning from the Scripture Ministry, ronrhodes.org. We carry six of his books currently, so that should be a testimonial in itself that we love what Ron Rhodes writes. This particular hour, because I was attracted to it, it's not a new book, but nonetheless, it's an important message, What Happens After Life, 21 Amazing Revelations About Heaven and Hell. And I'm hearing from more and more people who simply want to get to our eternal home because they are weary of dark headlines. Can't say I blame you. They are weary of bodily aches. They are weary of loved ones they've had to watch suffer, or they themselves are suffering in a tremendous way, physically, mentally, and they are tired of all the negative things that this earth has to offer. And so I was gravitated to what happens after life, and I'm talking to Ron Rhodes for the hour about it. Ron, let me get back to some of the topics at hand here. No one has to fear death. I think that's one of the messages of this hour. And secondly, I think we will recognize one another. We've already touched on that. Do you just want to reemphasize that? I think that's important to the listeners. Absolutely. I do believe that we will recognize each other in the afterlife. And I say that for several reasons. First of all, the Thessalonian Christians asked the Apostle Paul, what about Christians who have died? We understand what you say about living Christians being taken up at the rapture. But what about our dead parents, for example? So Paul wrote them back and talked about how the dead in Christ will rise first, and then the living will be caught up to meet them in the air with brand new, transformed, glorified bodies. That implies very strongly recognition. Why would Paul talk about a reunion if people didn't recognize each other in the afterlife? Certainly, we could point to Jesus' teaching in Luke 16, verses 19 and following, where we read about the rich man and Lazarus and Abraham— They all recognized each other in the afterlife. 
David was confident that he would be together with his dead son again in the afterlife and fully recognize him. To me, both the Old and the New Testaments confirm that we will recognize each other in the afterlife. The only thing that won't be there is all of our bad qualities, all of our sin, any kind of contentiousness. Some people engage in one-upmanship, pride, ego, all those kinds of things will be missing. You'll no longer recognize those things in your loved ones and your friends. But in terms of who we are as redeemed people, we will recognize each other in the afterlife. Ron, you say we will reign forever and ever. In other words, not just during the millennial kingdom where we do reign, that's a thousand years. We have some kind of reign or leadership in heaven as well. And you say we're going to even judge angels right now. We're lower than angels here on earth but we're going to have some kind of reign or leadership in heaven. Can you expound on that at all? And maybe it's heavily speculation, but I would like your perspective on that. I think Scripture teaches this. There's a number of occasions where Scripture promises that believers will reign with Christ. And here's what that might look like. The church is going to be raptured prior to the tribulation period. So the church is going to be in heaven during that time. But then following the second coming of Christ, which happens after the tribulation period, Christ will set up the millennial kingdom. So some people ask, what will the raptured church do during the millennial kingdom? It's apparent that the church or individual members of the church will participate in the government of Christ. We will reign with Christ. Now, the latter part of that phrase is very important, with Christ. Christ is the head. He's the one who is in charge. But each of us as believers will have varying roles of governmental authority that we will exercise during that kingdom. And not just in that kingdom, but beyond that into the eternal state. Jan, some scholars believe that this may not just relate to planet Earth. What if God's redemptive purposes involve the entire universe? Is it possible that our governmental structure or assignments will involve things in various parts of the universe. We don't know, but a number of very good scholars have talked about that as a possibility. Here's the thing I want to emphasize. People might wonder, how will my role be determined in this government? What will my role be as I reign with Christ? That is contingent on how you live as a Christian. The more committed you live as a Christian on this earth, the bigger your role will be. If you are a Christian who lives in a carnal way, or you're not fully committed to God, then you will have a much lesser role. That ought to be a motivation to re-examine your life to make sure everything is in conformity with the will of God today. I talk to some Christians who I believe are actually not all that excited about this. For some reason, they want to linger here on this rather troubled planet Earth. I'm going to play one more clip. It's Randy Alcorn again with John Ankerberg, again talking about this New Jerusalem or heaven and why would Christians think this might be a boring destination? Randy, I want to start with uh, a question we covered a little bit last week, and that was a lot of Christians aren't really excited about heaven. What do they think heaven's going to be if they're not excited about it? Well, they often think it's going to be one long, extremely boring church service. Not that all church services are boring, but you know, after a couple million years, it starts to wear on you a little bit. And that's what people are thinking. They, they really, there was, a, there was a far side cartoon where a guy's sitting on a cloud and uh, he's, uh, he's got his uh, stereotypical halo and supposed angel's wings and he's gone to heaven now and he's just sitting on the cloud doing no, nothing and the caption says, I wish I'd brought a magazine. And that's the way a lot of people think of it. Nothing to do, uh, no conversations to have, no place to go. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about this thing of what God says. Let me read it and put it on the table, and I'll let you kind of explain what we're talking about here. Revelation 21 2, God gives us a glimpse of heaven. And he says, the Apostle John writes, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them 
and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. We talked last week a little bit about what this is, and we've got present heaven, and we've got future heaven. And this is giving us a glimpse of future heaven, but it's also giving us a little bit of a glimpse of present heaven. Mm-hmm. Define the differences because people say, hey, come on, there's cha- heaven's going to change? Come on. Mm-hmm. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But heaven is a specific location. God is omnipresent. It means He dwells everywhere. But He has a special dwelling place that He chooses, and, and that's heaven. That's where His throne is. And we're told that God is going to move His special dwelling place from where heaven is now, outside of our observation, into the new heavens and the new earth and literally bring it down to earth. And Ephesians 1 talks about how heaven and earth will be joined under one head, Christ. And remember Christ's name, Emmanuel, that means God with us. This is going to be God with us us for all eternity. So when we see the throne of God in the new Jerusalem and we see Jesus sitting on the throne and it talks about the Father sitting on the throne as well, then that means that God has relocated his central dwelling place so that it's like the new Jerusalem is the capital city of the new earth, which is the capital planet of the new universe, a recreated, renewed universe. Ron Rhodes, do you want to comment on anything said in that little clip? Yeah, we're not going to have a boring existence in heaven. And I thought that somebody might mention playing a harp sitting on a cloud. To me, that would be anything but enjoyable. Scripture indicates that you and I, as redeemed believers, will be engaged in meaningful service throughout eternity. And this service will not be toilsome, it will not be draining, but it will be invigorating and fulfilling. As I pointed out earlier... Jesus indicates in his teachings, particularly in the parables, that our service assignment in the afterlife will relate to how faithfully we serve God during our mortal life on earth. And the more that we serve God faithfully in this life, the more we will be entrusted with in the next life. Psalm 1611 indicates that there will be fullness of joy in all of our activities. Part of that will involve reigning with Christ. Part of it will involve judging over the angels. Part of it will involve fellowshipping with other believers, family members and friends, people we've never met before. Certainly there's going to be some worship and praise of God and Jesus Christ, not like a boring church service, but true heartfelt worship. And I think one of the most wonderful things is that there's going to be plenty of rest in heaven. Revelation 14, verse 13. People talk about how tired they are today, how fatigued they are, how they never get enough sleep. One of the defining characteristics of heaven is that you will have plenty of rest. And you'll also be able to grow in your knowledge about God. God is awesome in his attributes. He is incomparably great. And throughout all eternity, you will continue to learn awesome things about our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ron, I'm transitioning here for a moment or two because we have listeners who've lost a child. They've lost an infant. Or perhaps we could be referring to in this discussion, babies have been aborted, there have been miscarriages. You bring out the fact that Jesus loves the little children and infants and children are never portrayed in hell. Why don't we just spend a moment on that? Because we've got some who have lost children and they need to be assured that they're going to see those infants again, even the aborted babies. That's right. And also babies that have been miscarried. Many women have had miscarriages. And if that describes you, then you've got a baby in heaven that you're one day going to meet. I believe that the redemption that Christ wrought upon the cross covers the sin that is in little babies. Now, you might look at a little baby and say, well, how could it have sin? How could this baby have a sin nature? The baby smells so good. His skin is so soft. The baby is so cuddly. But scripture does indicate that we're all born in sin. So that sin is in there. It may not manifest itself yet, but it's there. So what I believe happens is that at the moment of death, Christ applies the benefits of his death to that little baby, and that baby goes straight into the presence of God. Now, based upon that, I've got two young children I'm going to one day meet. My wife and I had two miscarriages years ago, so we look forward to meeting them one day in heaven. 
Now, here's the thing. A lot of people say, well, obviously, if babies get saved and young infants get saved and young children are covered by the death of Christ, at what point do they become responsible for themselves and they become responsible to believe in Jesus? That relates to what's called the age of accountability, and that's different for every child. James 4.17 gets to the heart of the matter. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Now, children come into moral awareness at different times. They all start to understand oughts and shoulds. And once they start to thoroughly understand that, along with the consequences and along with what God expects of us, then that responsibility to trust in Christ as our Savior becomes critically important. But let me just emphasize that you're right. Jesus loves the little children, Matthew 18, verses 1 to 14. You never witness an infant or young child portrayed as being in hell. You never witness an infant at the great white throne judgment. And when you look at the basis of the judgment of the lost, it's based upon their deeds, what they have done throughout earthly life. Now, a young infant and a young child are simply not responsible for their actions on earth. And so, therefore, it would be unfair of them to be judged on that basis. And so the death of Christ covers them. If you've lost a child, look forward to that reunion. It's going to be a glorious reunion. And the best of all is you're going to spend all eternity with that child who has passed on. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line Dr. Ron Rhodes talking about his little book, Quick to Read. You can read it in a few hours, What Happens After Life, 21 Amazing Revelations About Heaven and Hell. Let's quickly take, I don't want to say a trip to heaven, Ron, but let's quickly visit the heavenly tourism industry that's going on. And when Paul was caught up to heaven, he heard things he could not share. So why are dozens of modern people now who've made these supposed trips to heaven allowed to share about these supposed trips to heaven? And what's happening to them if they're not having a legitimate trip to heaven? The question is, if Paul was forbidden to describe what he witnessed in heaven, and he was instructed that no man may utter these things, why is it that multiple modern writers are allowed to write about their prolonged visits to heaven? Beyond that, Paul was an apostle. We're not apostles. Right. It just makes you wonder what's going on there. When you look at people who were resurrected during Bible times, you never see them talking about the afterlife. Lazarus would be a good example. When Lazarus was resurrected, we have no record of him saying anything about what he witnessed in the great beyond. There are other issues that are important. There are revelations coming to people in these experiences that contradict the Bible. For example, there's one near-death experience where God is described as a very big person. In other words, he looks like a human being, but he's just very, very big. And of course, Scripture teaches that God is spirit. He's not some big person as described here. Christians are described in some of these experiences as having wings and a halo. You don't see that in the Bible. But rather, these are really art forms that developed in church history long after the time the Bible was written. We also find various descriptions of people already having been resurrected, when Scripture clearly indicates that the resurrection will not take place until that future day of the rapture. Here's the thing I would be concerned about, Jan. Is there any possibility that what these people are doing can be construed as adding to Scripture? They've got these new revelations. Are they adding to the words of Scripture? The book of Revelation warns. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So people ought to be very, very cautious when talking about this. There are some people who have actually developed connections with occultism after dealing with some of these experiences. I'm talking about psychic events and psychic abilities. There's also the being of light that people come into contact with, and sometimes this being of light communicates unbiblical ideas, such as sin is not a problem, there is no hell to worry about, all people are welcome in heaven regardless of whether they place faith in Christ, and all religions are equally valid. Jan, who do you suppose would be inspiring those kinds of ideas? It would probably be Satan. My advice is this. No matter what experience you encounter, test it against Scripture. Let's be like the Bereans in Acts 17, and let's test everything that we hear against what the Scriptures say. And we see the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 5, where it says, test everything and hold on to the good. 
The scriptures alone are our barometer of truth. Test everything according to the word of God. So you include a chapter or two on hell, which obviously the Bible says this is eternal torment. It's not temporary. People are forever excluded from God. They're excluded from loved ones who went to heaven. There are some listening today, Ron, who are not ready for eternity. That is, they're not ready for a heavenly eternity. They are bound for hell, eternal separation, eternal torment. And without turning to Jesus Christ, they are bound for this literally unspeakable eternity. We talked earlier in the hour that eternity is forever, without end. That's something we can't really wrap our brain around. Besides, there are a lot of churches today that don't want to speak about hell, that don't want to speak about anything negative, but we must. I think we ought to wind things down here by reissuing this warning, by emphasizing the fact that hell is something that, again, I'm going to repeat myself, it's unthinkable. How can someone assure themselves that they are heaven-bound and not hell-bound? In answering that, let me first point out that people today are unaware of the day of their death. Now, some people do have a terminal disease, but one thing is certain. Death almost always comes sooner than we think. So the question is, will you be prepared or unprepared when that day arrives? One reason I wrote this book is to help prepare people for what's coming. Jan, I point out in the book that three people die every second. 180 people die every minute. 11,000 people die every hour. So during our one-hour chat together on the radio here, 11,000 people on earth have died. That's over a quarter of a million people per day. Many of those people are unprepared. Now, here's the thing. You've got the discussion of both heaven and hell. Let me first point out that Satan loves to cause doubts about heaven. One of the reasons why people are not so excited about heaven is because they have doubts. Remember what Satan said in the Garden of Eden? Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Well, today he causes a thought to come into our minds. Is there really a heaven where you will live forever? And if he can get us to have doubts about all this, he has succeeded in robbing us of spiritual joy. On the other hand, there are unsaved people, people who have never trusted in Christ, and they will die before they think they will die. In fact, there are people listening to my voice right now who may in fact be in mortal danger this very, very day. So that's why you should pay attention to this. Scripture does teach the reality of hell. And the one person who taught us more about hell than any other person in the Bible is Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus is love incarnate, and he is a loving being. But let me tell you something. Hell is so bad that he stepped out of eternity to die on our behalf so that he could rescue those who trust in him. The question is, will you trust in him for salvation? Hell is just as real a place as heaven is, and it's going to be a place of suffering. Hell is called eternal. It's just as eternal as heaven is. And hell is as bad as heaven is wonderful. Mm -hmm. These are deep things to ponder, Jan, but they're necessary to ponder. I thank you for being so forthright about that. One more point here, and then we're going to wind this down. But you state there's no such thing as an untimely death. What do you mean by that? On the human side, it seems like there are untimely deaths. For example, if we see a teenager crash into a tree... That seems to be an untimely death. But from God's side, God is sovereign over the day we die. In Job 14, 5, we are told that a human being's days are determined. And that word determined in the original Hebrew carries the idea of being engraved on stone. We might think of our time allotment on earth as being set in concrete by God. Now, for some people, it's very long. We grow into old age. For other people, it is a short amount of time. We see this in the Psalms. In your book were written, O Lord, every one of my days that were formed for me, when as yet none of those days have yet occurred. That's in Psalm 139, verse 16. We see the same thing in Acts 17, verse 26. God is sovereign over our day of death, and he's also sovereign over the circumstances of our death. We may not be able to fully understand the implications of all of that, but the scripture is quite clear that God is absolutely sovereign. Right now, for people who are hearing my voice, what's important is not to get all twisted out of shape by trying to understand the inscrutable things of God, but to try to understand the gospel that saves so that you can become a believer, which guarantees that you will go to heaven, the same heaven that we've been talking about this entire time. It is a gift. It's a free gift. So the question is, will you receive it? 
Again, learn more at ronroads.org, ronroads.org. He heads reasoning from the scriptures ministry. Let me go out of the hour. I'm going to quote just a couple of Bible verses, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 through 18, this light.